What would happen if every human being on Earth disappeared? This isn't the story of how we might vanish. It is the story of what happens to the world we leave behind. In this episode, life after people takes to the skies. What will happen to the most famous planes on Earth? What strange flying creatures will black out the sun? How might this spacecraft change the universe? And how did this secret place, designed to protect men from airborne Armageddon, become a post-apocalyptic nightmare? Welcome to Earth. Population zero. For a creature so bound to the Earth, mankind's dreams often took him to the skies. But what will now become of the engineering humans use to conquer the air? And what will seize control of the skies? One day, after people. Air Force One, the most recognized plane in the world, sits empty on the tarmac of Andrews Air Force Base. 63 feet longer than the actual White House, it was built with the body of a Boeing 747. It's two kitchens, a soundproof conference room, and an entire bay of secure communications made Air Force One unlike any other plane in the world. There is an enormous amount of extra equipment on board Air Force One, equipment that you would never see on a private jetliner or a, a regular commercial jet. This includes an array of top secret defense systems. There was a danger that the plane could be a target for missiles. So Air Force One packs an ingenious countermeasure. If a heat-seeking missile locked onto the plane, a series of false target flares would shoot out, generating more heat than the engines themselves and diverting the missiles. Air Force One was a state-of-the-art fortress. Aircraft are not designed to sit around not being maintained. Air Force One has more stuff in it that can go wrong than any other 747s in the world. In a life after people, a small malfunction can lead to a high-flying failure. Two days after people, the highest mountain on Earth no longer welcomes any climbers. At more than 29,000 feet, the summit of Mount Everest reached nearly as far into the sky as most commercial airliners. The final 3,000 feet to its summit was called the death zone because there's so little oxygen at this height, the human body could not sustain itself. You've got one third the oxygen that you have at sea level. Basically, you're gonna have acute mountain altitude sickness. And as it gets worse, you get fluid in the lungs or fluid in the brain. And as that progresses, people are gonna die. With every ounce of energy needed just to survive, climbers routinely left behind food tins, plastics, used oxygen bottles, and almost anything that wasn't essential. In 1994, Climber Brent Bishop organized a cleanup effort that removed 25,000 pounds of trash from the mountain. But with 400 climbers a season, refuse continued to be a problem. And one day after people, the mountain's mighty glaciers conceal even greater secrets that aren't going to vanish into the thin air.
three days after people. Although some battery-powered radios are still on, the broadcasts have ceased. Nearly 15,000 radio stations once beamed news, talk, and music across the United States every day. Now, with people gone and the power failing, radio all over the nation signs off forever. Yet there's one place in the American Southwest this is KTOW's 101. Where the airwaves still crackle with the voices of man. And sweet sounds from all over the world. New Mexico radio station KTAO is completely solar powered. It's the cleanest sound on earth. And because of its remote location, it was engineered for a computer to take over anytime humans weren't there. With the best in reggae, blues, and sweet sounds. In the northern part of the state, Music and announcements beam across the land Home of solar radio without any human out. input. Put a little sunshine in your ears with zero emissions radio. Four days after people, airports that once thronged with passengers are vacant. And so was the airspace around the world. In the time of humans, there were more than 5,000 flights in the skies above the United States alone at any given moment. Now, there are none. This happened only four times in modern aviation history three times in the 1960s, when the military cleared the skies to test their radar warning system. And most recently, after the attacks of September 11, 2001. For three days after 9-11, commercial flights were grounded. Scientists noticed a surprising side effect. Each day the planes were out of the sky, the average difference between the high and low temperatures across the United States increased by two degrees. Why? Normally, jet plane contrails spread out in the sky, creating a thin but significant layer of artificial clouds. Some atmospheric scientists believe this layer kept the Earth a little warmer at night, like a blanket, and cooler during the day because it reflected some of the sun's heat in a life after people. The absence of this artificial cloud cover could quickly change the climate on Earth. One week after people, seagulls and Canada geese flock to airports, taking advantage of the peace and quiet. Canada geese like to graze. They're basically flying cows. The thing that attracts gulls to airports is the big open space. They like to have what we call loafing areas, where they can sit and rest and see any danger approaching. In the time of humans, the greatest danger was an airplane. In the United States, bird strikes happened an average of 20 times a day most famously in 2009, when U.S. Airways Flight 1549 suffered complete engine failure when it ran into a flock of geese just after takeoff. Only the miraculous landing by pilot Chesley Sullenberger prevented a catastrophic crash. But collisions between birds and planes didn't just start in the jet age. The first recorded bird strike was in 1905. The pilot? Orville Wright. Of all the aircraft that forever revolutionized the world of man, possibly the most famous was the Spirit of St. Louis. Piloted by Charles Lindbergh, 
It was the first plane to ever be flown solo across the Atlantic. Many believe this daring achievement convinced the public that the skies did indeed belong to mankind. One week after people, that plane is still aloft because it hangs from the ceiling of the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Suspended by three cables that loop through ordinary bolts, how long before the renowned aircraft makes its final flight? One month after people, the tallest structure in North America still stands. It's not the Empire State Building, the Sears Tower, or Canada's CN Tower. It's the 2,063-foot-high KVLY TV Tower in North Dakota. Broadcast towers are usually placed on top of hills, mountains, or existing skyscrapers. But here on the wide open Great Plains, building tall was the only way to reach an audience of 240,000 households spread out over more than 15,000 square miles. The galvanized steel frame was engineered to withstand severe winter storms and 85 mile per hour winds. Now, the tremendous height of towers like this one makes them big targets for nature's arsenal. It has happened before. Their failures, and there have been many, are spectacular. Six months after people. Of all the plants growing on the earth, the tallest is the coast redwood in Northern California at 379 feet. With a lifespan that can stretch for 2,000 years, a tree that was a seedling when Jesus was born could have been overflown by a plane in the 21st century. In the time of humans, wildland managers sought to protect them by suppressing forest fires. Now, with no firefighters to beat back the flames, wildfires burn unchecked. But redwoods are hard to kill. When fire burns their leaves, it triggers a signal in the trees to sprout new limbs and shoots. While their competitors are often destroyed, redwoods quickly flourish again. And although man is gone, some other creatures from Earth are rocketing toward a new frontier. One year after people, the plane that was Air Force One has begun to rust on the tarmac of Andrews Air Force Base. The tarmac was once kept pristine by a ground team that scoured the pavement for any debris before each flight. Now, Brush has already begun to take it back. We know this because there's an abandoned airport in Berlin, Germany, that already shows what life is like one year after people. Tempelhof. In 2008, the enormous terminal was closed to air traffic. But it was once ground zero for the most massive air relief operation in history. Six decades ago, these runways were a frenzy of air traffic in one of the first major struggles of the Cold War, the Berlin Airlift. It was a constant sound in the air of those incoming airplanes. Every 90 seconds, there was traffic on those runways. 
In 1948, Berlin was deep inside Soviet-occupied Germany. The city was divided in half between the Soviets and the West. When a struggle for territorial control boiled over, the Russians blockaded West Berlin, cutting off all food and supplies by ground. West Berliners faced starvation or surrender. The threat for the West Berliners was that we then would have been taken by the Russians and would have finally lost our freedom. The West responded with the airlift. Fully loaded cargo planes roared in and out of Tempelhof every minute and a half, ferrying up to 13,000 tons of food and supplies a day. After 10 and a half months, the Soviets lifted the blockade, and Tempelhof became known as the airport that saved the city. Shut down in the 21st century, after a more modern airport opened outside the city, its ticket counters are empty. Its vast hallways are filled only with shadows. And wild grass obscures signs on the runways that once made history. Three years after people. In the wilderness of Yellowstone National Park, a tiny flying creature that once terrified North America has returned. The Rocky Mountain Locust. They were a common sight in the 19th century. Swarms that were often 2,000 square miles blackened the skies from the Rocky Mountains to the Mississippi River. Like a biblical plague, wherever they landed, the ravenous mass devoured every blade of vegetation. They're pelting you. They're landing, crawling, crawling up into your clothing. It's like a horrific rainstorm or, or a hailstorm of locusts as they cover everything. In 1875, one outbreak was so massive it was deemed the largest single gathering of living creatures in recorded history. Nothing comes close to this enormous swarm of Rocky Mountain locusts in 1875. That swarm was approximately 1,800 miles long and 110 miles wide. If we had squared them up, it would have covered the state of Colorado border to border. But in the late 19th century, Settlers began farming on the insects' fragile habitat in the river valleys of the upper Rocky Mountains. Within 25 years, the locusts disappeared. Only a few small pockets may have survived in pristine places like Yellowstone National Park. Three years after people, the population of a surviving pocket of locusts grows in the absence of humans. Might the ravaging swarms that once terrified settlers return? Five years after people. Although most planes are just slowly deteriorating, Air Force One has hidden potential for disaster. One of these is a defense system called false target flares, which divert heat-seeking missiles away from the plane. But the electrical circuits that trigger them were never meant to go unmaintained. The flare circuits, they are a major point of failure. These things are dangerous if just left in place. They deteriorate very quickly. When a circuit fails, it deploys the flares. The plant growth on the tarmac below becomes kindling for a massive blaze. And the plane itself has plenty of fuel to feed the fire. Unlike most planes, 
Air Force One's 50,000 gallon fuel tanks were kept filled in case the president had to be flown out of harm's way at a moment's notice. But now, there is no one to move Air Force One out of harm's way. Eight years after people, a spacecraft called Cassini silently orbits Saturn, 750 million miles from the Earth. In the time of humans, it generated countless revelations about the ringed planet and our solar system. Now, it is quite alone in the frigid void of outer space. Well, not quite alone. In the innards of the Cassini spacecraft, there are probably uh, very, very hardy bacteria which hitched a ride on the mission. They are called extremophiles. We know that these extremophiles can survive very harsh conditions. We find them in the dry valleys of Antarctica. We find them in the Yellowstone mud pot. We find them in basically every environment, no matter how harsh. These hardy bacteria were believed to stow away on all kinds of space vehicles to make sure there'd be no unintended consequences from these microorganisms crash landing on the surface of another world. NASA planned to end Cassini's mission by incinerating it in Saturn's atmosphere. Now, without mission control to order its demise, Cassini and its tiny stowaways are on a voyage into uncharted territory. Ten years after people, airports are already crumbling. Many simply weren't built to last. Architects are quite humble about airports. A terminal building often doesn't last more than 40 or 50 years before it's massively redesigned. So we have the ultimate disposable building. There were some exceptions, like the otherworldly LAX theme building at Los Angeles International Airport. The architectural landmark was constructed in 1961 to resemble a landing spacecraft. It was called the theme building to usher in a jet age theme for the airport. By 2010, it was one of the few surviving airport buildings of its era because of a two year renovation that strengthened it to withstand the test of time. 10 years after people, its arches dominate the empty airport. And it will continue to endure because of a surprising form of protection that will keep it safe from nature's most powerful forces. But there is no protection for the buildings of a little-known enclave that once safeguarded North America from an airborne Armageddon. Now, it faces an apocalypse of its own. Ten years after people. The places that once protected mankind from nuclear destruction now face destruction of their own. It's a future that has already happened here at Edgar Radar Station. Edgar looked like an ordinary town but the entire site was built in 1952 for one sole reason, to scan the skies for an airborne apocalypse. The Defense Department realized that uh, the Russians would be able to build plenty of nuclear weapons, put them in bombers, fly the bombers over the North Pole and destroy targets in Canada and in the United States. 
Situated about 80 miles north of Toronto, Canada, Edgar was large enough to be a self-contained town and self-sufficient as a matter of security. We had everything, dentists, we had uh, doctors, we had uh, messing facilities, a recreation center with an indoor swimming pool. More than 300 people lived and worked on the base that hummed with daily life. Now, stools at the station snack bar sit long empty. A tree branch sprawls across the roof of an abandoned home. The floor of the old gym is in ruins. And some buildings have already been entirely demolished. This is what's left of the single men's barracks. You can actually see the tile still on what was once the inner floor, and you can see where the walls and corridors actually laid out. The entire enclave was built to support a single technology, radar. It scoured the northern skies 24 hours a day for an attack by Soviet planes laden with atomic bombs. The more that the United States and Canada knew about Russian intentions, the less chance there was for someone to make a mistake and push the button. Radar's electromagnetic waves could pierce the sky for some 200 miles. If a plane was in that radius, waves would bounce back from it, providing critical information about where the plane was and how fast it was flying. That capacity made Edgar part of the first early warning system, but it also put the base near the top of the enemy target list. Radar can be homed in on by the coming forces, and naturally the Soviet Union would like to knock our eyes out so we couldn't see them. So we were very vulnerable here. Life at Edgar was always on edge. Very tense. It was very tense for, uh, for everyone. For 12 years, Edgar's radar searched the skies. In 1964, the station was made obsolete by a longer range radar base needed for a new threat, intercontinental missiles. Over the years, as attack times shrank from hours to minutes, the job of advance warning rose to the ultimate vantage point. Satellites in outer space. Although the radar operations at Edgar were removed, the remainder of the base was used by civilians until 1999, when it was closed for good. Ten years of decay has taken its toll. The movie theater has an audience of none. A children's playground is conceding its turf to nature. The single women's dorm has long been empty. Its entryway has faded, but not the memories of what once happened here. She was standing right there, and I got down on my hands and knees, and I said, Joy, will you marry me? The gymnasium that was Edgar's home court is now home to birds. Gala celebrations once held here are but distant memories. This is where Joy and I, my fiance, uh, went and celebrated our engagement uh, at the New Year's Eve ball for the rest of the base. Now, the floors have buckled almost beyond recognition. The green line here is the outer bound line for basketball court. A very small amount of water has actually caused this damage. If you think about it, these little drops of water have created a wave of wood. The community that once watched the skies for an attack 
is now under assault from above. In this new war, the buildings of Edgar are defenseless. As life after people continues, what secret will be revealed on the highest mountain in the world? You're listening to KTOWS 101.9. 15 years after people. It's the cleanest sound on Earth. Powered by the sun, the radio station KTAO broadcasts some of the last human voices to be heard on the land. And sweet sounds from all over the world. This is KTOWS 101.9. But inside the computer that automatically plays the music, the bearings of the cleaning fan grind to a halt. Across the windswept hills of the southwest, birds still chirp. Coyotes howl. But as the station computer overheats, the music of mankind falls forever silent. Twenty years after people, the Cassini spacecraft continues to orbit Saturn. But Saturn also has more than 50 moons, making any orbit fraught with peril. Now, the spacecraft smashes into one of these moons. It should be the last of Cassini, but this moon has something that was never expected in the frigid depths of space around Saturn. Thirty years after people. On the distant horizon of the prairie, a dark cloud blots out the sun. Within minutes, a frenzied crush of insects from a swarm big enough to cover the entire state of Delaware pours out of the sky. Once so few in numbers, many scientists believed they were extinct. The Rocky Mountain locust has returned. We're hesitant to use the E word in ecology and entomology, that E word being extinction. And the reason is what we call the Lazarus effect. The Lazarus effect is when any species thought to be gone forever is found, as if it came back from the dead. The return of the locusts is tied to their cousins that live just outside Yellowstone Park, grasshoppers. In a life after people, grasshoppers are no longer controlled by pesticides, and their numbers explode. Birds that kept locusts in check for decades now gorge on grasshoppers instead. For the first time in more than a century, locusts flourish. And it's when they sense their territory is becoming overcrowded that instinct tells them to take to the air in mass in search of more food. 30 years after people, the Rocky Mountain locust swarms into the skies of the American Midwest once again. Thirty-five years after people, some of the highest glaciers in the world inch down Mount Everest. Entombed within the ice is refuse that climbers once tossed away. They believed the colossal ice would crush it to smithereens. There was this theory that the glacier with the millions of tons of ice would just grind up whatever trash was dumped into the crevasse into dust. But they found that, you know, 30, 40 years later, things came out at the foot of the glacier relatively intact. 35 years after people, 
a length of rope with a climber's gloves still curled around it emerges from the glacial ice. But the frozen citadel has yet one more secret, inching its way down the mountain. Fifty years after people, the KVLY Tower, the tallest structure in North America, still soars the equivalent of more than 150 stories into the North Dakota sky. It was built to withstand almost all forms of extreme weather, except severe ice and wind, just like the second tallest structure in North America, the TV tower of a sister station, KXJB. Less than 10 miles away, it was just three feet shorter. In April 1997, when a severe ice storm struck, the fierce wind and weight of the ice sent the second tallest structure crashing to the ground. Five decades after people, an ice storm blows in again, buffeting the nearly 900,000 pounds of tower. As the ice builds up, it adds hundreds of thousands of pounds to the structure. The huge stress of the extra weight shears section bolts right off, snapping the tower in the middle. The top of the tower plummets for more than 10 seconds and can accelerate to nearly 250 miles an hour before smashing into the earth. Its reign as the tallest structure on the continent is cut short. Across the country, the spirit of St. Louis rocks in the wind that whistles through the National Air and Space Museum. In 1976, curators had the plane carefully inspected. Apart from minor rust and small tears in the cotton fabric of the fuselage, the aircraft was perfectly fit to fly. The weakness now is not with the plane, but the system that holds it aloft. The three cables and clamps that secure it to the ceiling are strong enough to hold five times the weight of the plane. But the cables loop through standard steel bolts never designed to withstand decades rocking in the wind. Exposure to the elements combines with the chafing of the cable to weaken the bolts until each fails. And the plane that so sensationally opened the doors to global air traffic makes one final flight. The fate of high-flying relics is just one of civilization's many falls. Yet one otherworldly crash will plant some shocking new seeds. One hundred twenty-five years after people, the only two buildings remaining at the Los Angeles airport are the steel reinforced control tower and the LAX theme building. In the time of humans, seismologists discovered a major fault line just a few miles away. They calculated that the odds of a massive quake were just one in eight in the next 125 years. As a part of the overhaul of the theme building in 2010, engineers installed 1.2 million pounds of steel on rubber rollers to counteract the devastating shock waves of a quake. Called a mass damper, these systems are typically placed underneath or inside buildings, but the space age architecture of the theme building made that unworkable. Think about the theme building, four stilts, not really connected to one another until you get up to the restaurant level. And you'd want the four stilts to all move perfectly together. Um, there would be no way to guarantee that in an earthquake. Instead, it became the first building in North America with a mass damper on the roof. 
125 years after people, when a violent 6.5 quake strikes at dawn, the mass damper saves the theme building, leaving it the only structure at the airport still standing. Five thousand years after people, a glacier on Mount Everest is in a spring melt once again. What thaws is a shocking remnant: the frozen corpse of a climber. We know humans can be preserved in glaciers because of Otzi the Ice Man. He was found on a melting snowpack in the Italian Alps in 1991, some 5,300 years after he died. His body had been so perfectly preserved that scientists could even determine what he had eaten for his final two meals from the contents of his stomach. Of the more than 180 climbers who died on Everest, as many as 50 were never recovered. There have been climbers that have been caught in avalanches. They've been trapped in the Kumbu Icefall when tons of ice have shifted. It's likely that most of those people are still trapped on the mountain, if you will, entombed in the ice. Now, the sun and flow of glacial ice have freed one climber. But there are no scientists to greet him only water and bacteria that make quick work of his remains. Two million years after people, the Cassini spacecraft is long gone. But its stowaways have flourished because the moon they smashed into was a very special one called Enceladus. It is one of the few places in the solar system believed to have liquid water. If Cassini were to crash on Enceladus, then it's possible that the bacteria that hitched a ride on the spacecraft could survive in that watery region just below Enceladus's surface. In a thousand years, you would have a, a growing colony of bacteria in the Enceladus environment. And over millions of years, and even billions of years, that bacteria might evolve into a whole ecosystem. It would be quite remarkable if the sort of final legacy of our technological society here on Earth was the greening of another moon in the solar system. Where humans reached for the sky, it appears that the sky was not, in fact, the limit. Cold, dark space has proven surprisingly open to Earth's most unstoppable force, life. In the next episode, Life After People goes underground and underwater. From NORAD's secret mountain headquarters to a bizarre underground mine, how will the underworld change when man is gone? And what secrets will be revealed when we unearth the Titanic of the West?